All right, are you ready for the word? All right, it's gonna be a little unique this time. I know that surprises you, doesn't it? There is one thing that makes Christianity, a few things, but one thing especially that makes Christianity incredibly unique. And it started in the upper room. We're in this series of the book of Acts this summer. And Jesus has these followers and they're ready. They are raging ready to do his work, to give their lives for him. And he said, before you do anything, you gotta go to this room and just hang out there for a while. You gotta wait. His first command, which is kind of interesting when we look at the pace of which you do life, his first command is wait. Just be still. Because something would take place in the upper room, the book of Acts teaches us, that would separate this group of people for 2,000 years to us. Every religion has its place of worship. Every religion has its book. Every religion has its idea of afterlife. Even people who don't believe in a God have their place of worship and their book that they follow. But what makes us distinct and different is we know that the actual creator of the universe, the living God, dwells fully in each of us. Do you really know that? Are you fully aware of what that means, that we are a people of the divine presence? Because the upper room was really just a fulfillment of what God had wanted since creation. You read in Genesis, God's desire is to hang out with Adam and Eve. He goes down there. They have these conversations. They're drinking a cappuccino together. They're talking because God wants to be with them. But then sin puts a barrier. And Adam and Eve are now separated. But it doesn't stop God's heart. And God's heart is to be fully with you. So God devises this plan all around his objective. How do I get closer to my creation? How do I get closer to my people? Moses has the Israelites and they're gonna be a nation out of which the Savior would come. But while they're a nation, God says, put up a tent of meeting and it's a place where I will dwell. And it's kind of on the outside of where all the Israelites, millions, camped together. And they would go out to the tent of meeting because God wanted to be with his people. But for God, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough that he was on the outside where they would have to come out to him. He wanted to be closer to his people. So as Israel settles into their land and as they establish their life and they set up kings, God comes to the most important king named David and he gives him plans for a temple that would not be on the outside, but would now be right in the middle of where they lived. And David's son Solomon, who is the next king, builds this temple. Why? Because God wants to be with his people. And when Solomon finished building the temple, he had this prayer to God. And the Old Testament always points to Jesus in our life. So I'm gonna read you this prayer and it's gonna be on the screens. But as I read this prayer to you, imagine Solomon praying for you as the temple of the Lord. Second Chronicles 6, 18 to 20 says this. But would God really dwell on earth with humans? The heavens, even the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built Yet, Lord, my God, give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy. Hear the cry and the prayer of your servant that your servant is praying in your presence. May your eyes be open toward this temple day and night, this place of which you said you would put your name there. May you hear the prayer your servant prays towards this place. And then God replies to this prayer. And again, listen to God's reply, not as a reply to Solomon, but as a reply to you. 1 Kings 9.3 says this, Then the Lord said to him, I have heard the prayer and plea you have made before me. I have consecrated this temple which you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. God's talking about you. So there's this temple, this building right in the middle of it, but it's still not good enough for God. He needs to get closer. So he comes up with this brilliant idea. I'll become like one of them. 
I'll take on flesh. I'll experience what they're experiencing. Now I really know them. I will join them. I want to be so close to Joel, I'm going to become like Joel. And the Son of God comes in human flesh and takes on an earthly name, Jesus. And when he walks this earth, and you read about what he does on this earth, he's always touching people. It doesn't matter if they're lepers or prostitutes. Every human life has such great value to him that he's touching them. He's hugging the children. Religious leaders, disciples are going, no, don't touch them. No, I just got to get close to people. This is God's heart. His desire is to be so close to you that he comes, but then he's going to ascend and people who follow him are going, no, we finally got God in our midst. Jesus is finally here. Don't leave. We've never experienced this before. And Jesus says, it's actually better for you that I leave. Because God wasn't even satisfied being in human form with us. He wanted to get so close to us. He wanted to be so present in your life that the only thing that would satisfy God's heart is to be in you one with you. So he says, go to this upper room and wait, and the Spirit of God will now fill you and be fully in you. You now become the temple. Look how Paul wrote it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells fully in you? I used to pray the wrong prayer. I used to pray, God, would you please be present? He's fully present. I just wasn't aware of it. And I began to pray, God, make me aware of your presence. So I'm here this morning, and we're going to open up the word to discover how do we become aware of God's presence, where we hear his voice, where we feel his presence. The issue is not God wanting to or being present. The issue is, are you aware of it? And for you to be aware of God's presence, you have to be fully present. And the Bible tells us there are three areas where we have to be fully present. And when we are fully present, we become aware of God's presence. And maybe you're here this morning and you're going, Joel, I just don't feel very aware of God's presence. Sometimes it's the opposite of that. Listen with an open heart and an open mind. There is a story that's given to us. Three simple little verses of a story that took place where these Christians kind of gathered together. And it's one of those stories that could you kind of gloss over. But in it, we have this model, this example of how we're supposed to live in our life. And if we do this, you will be fully, this week, fully aware of his presence in you, and you will walk at another level of victory and authority in your life. The story comes to us from Acts chapter 13, verses one through three. If you have your Bibles, open them there, otherwise it'll be on the screens. Here's the story. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Now we get a list of them. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Here's a picture of spiritual friends who are sharing a sacred encounter for the purpose of their divine purpose. Spiritual friends sharing a sacred encounter regarding their divine purpose. If you are present with spiritual friends sharing a sacred encounter regarding your divine purpose, like them, you will be so fully aware of God's presence, but you gotta be present with spiritual friends sharing a sacred encounter regarding your divine purpose. Let's unpack this a little bit. First, be present with spiritual friends. Here's five guys. Barnabas, Paul, Simeon, Lucius, Manan, they were together to encounter the presence of God. They weren't just friends. 
They weren't just acquaintances. They weren't just hanging out. They knew that somehow when we get together, something supernatural takes place where two or three are gathered in my name. I am fully present there, the Lord says. So they knew there's something deeper going on. Now, if you look at them, sometimes when we go, well, I don't know if I really qualify for God's full presence. What's interesting about these five guys is how different they were. Paul was a Jew, Barnabas was a Greek, Simeon was from Africa, Lucius was from the Arab world, Menean was a politician raised in the courts. They were radically different, but all of them were welcome. All of them had a role to play. Christianity is the most inclusive group of people there is. You don't have to dress like me. You don't have to always think like me. You don't have to be like me. At the foot of the cross, everybody is welcome. Everybody is invited no matter who you are. You qualify for the spiritual friends where God is fully present for you. Here's how John 14 says it. I will ask the Father, this is Jesus speaking, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and be, will be in you. Sometimes they'll say, you know, I don't know if I really need spiritual friends. I don't know if I need really this experience. I can just kind of do it alone. I can read my Bible, I can pray, I can put on some worship music. I can do it alone. One of the most important reasons why you need spiritual friends may not be today, but it will be tomorrow. Where you need to prepare for the future. These five get together and they have a God encounter, but they had a growing friendship together. Last year, uh, a lady came up to me at Cottonwood and she had tears in her eyes. She had been at the church for two years and she was now going through just a horrific divorce, which is just such a hard thing to do and kind of rips your soul in half. And we're having this conversation. She says, I feel so alone. She says, I feel like I don't have any friends. Nobody understands me. And then she said something I will never forget. She said, two years ago when I first came here, the first message I heard, she said, I don't even know who was speaking it, but the first message I heard from the pastors was that you need spiritual friends. You need to get into a group. You need to be in a community. And at that point, she said, Joel, I just thought to myself, no, I'm good. She goes, now two years later, I wish I would have done that because I had no idea what I would be going through and now I'm so alone. God is fully in you. But you don't really become aware of it on your own. He designed you so that you would become aware of it with other people where you are actually needed by them. These five, all very different, they all heard the word of the Lord together. It wasn't just Paul getting it, they all got it together. So you are greatly needed. Think of it this way, Let me say, let's say I say, hey, I just got a new Tesla, come to my garage and check out my new Tesla. And you're going, wow, I would love to see this new Tesla. And you come into my garage and you kind of get this strange look on your face because there's no Tesla there. In the corner are some headlights, there's a battery leaning against the wall, there's a few tires down here, an axle over there. But it's all separated, it's just people, pieces. It's all in the garage together, but it's not assembled. So you look at these pieces and you kind of have a sense, well, it must be a Tesla. But it's not assembled, so it doesn't have the beauty or the function. The Bible says we are to be assembled. It's not just showing up for a church service. It is to be assembled together where you have these spiritual friends. And if you're a headlight, you don't really know how valuable you are until you are connected to the electrical system and that headlight shines so the car can go forward. If you're a tire, you don't know. If you're like me and you're just an exhaust pipe, it still counts. <laughs> you are needed. One of the coolest things I'm doing right now is on Tuesday nights, me and a few hundred students are getting together for this class called Made for More. And we get together around round tables and we open up the word and we study together. And every one of them is participating and every one of them is needed because they're sharing their insights and what God taught them. And together we are discovering the presence of God in such a wonderful way. Here you have this picture of spiritual friends. And if you don't have any, God is not angry. 
but he's here to remind you this morning, there's so much more of me for you, but it will only come when you open your heart and your life to others. You gotta have your five. These five were together and they're praying and they're worshiping and they're believing and they're having this, these shared spiritual relationships. You gotta open your heart to those. Some of the most important areas in which I believe we make that available is what Cottonwood calls support groups. Because when you are going through a really hard time, it is really difficult to make those kinds of friends. So we specifically offer Man, if you're going through a loss and you are grieving, we have a grief support group. Spiritual friends who have gone through the same thing and together you become aware of the presence of God. If you're a single mom and you got three kids and you're just trying to juggle and keep your head above water and it seems overwhelming, there's a single mom support group other single moms, and you get together and you discover the presence of God. If you have an addiction that you have been trying to break on your own and God seems a million miles away in his strength, there's a support group of spiritual friends who are going through what you're going through. They are not the experts. They're just one. Like these five, they come together and go, wow, if we're not together, God's not as fully present. If we are together, then God's fully present. But they didn't just get together. They got together for a sacred encounter. Spiritual friends sharing a sacred encounter. And if you're gonna be fully aware of God's presence, you have to know that God wants to have this sacred encounter with you. When you look at this story in Acts 13, what's unusual is they're praying and they're worshiping, which would be normal for pastors and spiritual leaders. They hear from God, but they don't go off and do it. When they hear from God, they go back to praying and worshiping because what mattered was praying and worshiping, this sacred encounter that they wanted to have. They were focused in the moment. They weren't just asking God a question, got the answer, go on. They were going, no, I want the presence of God fully here. And that presence comes through what we call these spiritual disciplines. But you got to understand what happens. When you start to pray and read your Bible, you are not going to the gym to work out to become a stronger Christian. You are opening the doorway to know God's presence because the Holy Spirit then kicks in. The Bible says when we open the word, the Holy Spirit becomes active, reminding us and teaching us. When we pray, the Spirit of God begins to pray with us. So God says, I want you to do these things because when you worship and when you pray and when you read your Bible, that's when you're gonna be aware that I am fully, fully present. But you have got to give your attention to these things. You cannot expect to be aware of God's full presence without being present for these sacred encounters. Here's how Jesus put it in John 15. He says this, but when the Holy Spirit comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will remind you fully about me. It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? We're gonna forget? We're actually gonna forget about God? Yes. Do you know why we forget about God's presence? Now be honest, I won't ask you to raise your hand. Even when you read your Bible and pray in the morning, by one o'clock in the afternoon, it's out of your mind. And then when you go to sleep, you go, oh wow, God was with me. But we can go many hours and we forget about the creator of the universe living in us. Do you know why? Because we have lost our minds. <laughs> Society has this vortex that ramps up our life with such an incredible RPM and our engines are just wheezing. And we're so busy. Sometimes I wonder if there were aliens and they didn't know anything about us and they came to learn from us and they didn't know what phones were. They would think these must be the most magical things because they even go to the toilet with them. <laughs> and God says, give me your attention. Give me your attention. 
I used to read my Bible and pray in the morning and I used to do a little bit of it in the evening and I realized at one o'clock, God was gone. And I had to wire in time in the middle of the day so that I could be so fully aware of his presence. And then I started a practice about a year ago that I wanna encourage you to do and it'll freak most of you out. I would get up in the morning to be present with God and be fully present. So I'd open my Bible and I'd pray, but already my mind was going. Already I'd check the news on my phone. And I began to just breathe 30 deep breaths before I'd read my Bible and pray in the morning. Just to focus my attention to be fully present with the God who wanted to be fully present with me. The first time I did it, I lasted 12 breaths. I thought, I can't do this. And then slowly I began to realize how the world around me, by my own choice, causes me and my mind to function at such a speed that I am not fully present, even when I open my Bible. And so I would just breathe. Spiritual friends, sharing sacred encounters where the presence of God is beyond even your need. When you come to the word and to worship together, when you pray, it's even greater than what needs you have. You know God is listening and he answers your need. But these guys, when they get together, there's this need and they're praying and they're worshiping and they're having this sacred encounter. And even after the Holy Spirit speaks to them, they don't care. They just wanna be in the presence of God. Listen, friends, God is not Siri or Alexa. You do not cry out to him hoping he hears you. And you know, sometimes Siri doesn't quite get your voice. You go, ah! But the moment Siri or Alexa tell you what you need, you just go on with your life. And you miss out on the presence of God in your life. So here are these spiritual friends having this incredible, sacred encounter and they are overwhelmed at the presence of God. When was the last time you were so overwhelmed at the presence of God as you gathered together? That's why here at Cottonwood, we continue to put such a spotlight on this idea of communities. Because when we're together on a Sunday morning, it's glorious, but you cannot make spiritual friends on a Sunday morning. But together, In these communities, you got a handout when you came in. It's a QR code. If you're saying, I would like more of an awareness of God being fully present, you may want to look at this. You may want to discover that you need to be more present in these sacred encounters with spiritual friends, and you'll be amazed at how God will be present. Actually, I want you to do something. For those of you who are here and you're in a community, men, women, young adults, whatever it may be, one of those support groups, whatever it may be, would you just raise your hand, just lift your hand up. Wow, look around. Listen, I have a message for you. I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you for being a spiritual friend, for being present. Because the more we come together in this way, especially in light of all that we are facing in society and in this world, the more every one of us will never question the presence of God, but we will just be overwhelmed by his presence. Spiritual friends sharing sacred encounters, but for their divine purpose. It wasn't just about them, there was something else going on, and we have to be present in this divine purpose that he has given to everyone because here's these guys and they're getting together in a house just like our groups get together and they're praising and they're worshiping and they're looking at the word and the Holy Spirit speaks to them but they keep doing it but the word of the Holy Spirit to them is a word that sends them into their divine purpose. You have a divine purpose. Every one of you, every one of us has this divine purpose but we will only fully be aware of God's presence when we're walking into that divine purpose. When we are distracted or walking aimlessly, then we miss out on the awareness of God's full presence but when we are walking in his purpose for every one of us, you become so clearly aware of God. Their desire in this story, they want to be where God is and they want to do what God is doing. 
so that they can experience his presence. When my daughter was six years old, she was going to bed and I was doing kind of the dad devotional thing, talking to her and telling her you know, about following Jesus. And this six-year-old daughter asked the most what I thought was insightful question. I said, Lisa, you, you gotta follow Jesus with your life. She said, Daddy, where's he going? <laughs> I thought that was really insightful. Where's he going? Acts 1.8 answers this for us, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When you are walking in your divine calling, your divine purpose, do you know what you're gonna discover? God's presence in the very lost people he is sending you to. Jesus said this, when you do it to the least of these, when you feed them, when you clothe them, when you show them love, when you tell them about me, when you do it to the least of them, you do it to me. We think we bring Jesus to a lost world, do you know what? They bring Jesus to us. And when you are in this divine purpose, you discover so much more of Jesus. I was sitting with some friends and we're watching TV and a commercial comes on about children who are in the world in a crisis. It was a ministry that was trying to raise some money for those children. And my friend says, oh, Joel, turn the channel. Sometimes that's our temptation. We see a lost and hurting world, a world that sometimes is angry at us. We go, I just turn the channel. But when we turn the channel to a lost and hurting world, we're actually turning the channel away from God because he's there and he is present. And when you discover your divine purpose, which may be as simple as walking across the street and inviting somebody to church, as volunteering in one of our outreaches, when you discover your divine purpose, what you will discover most of all is the presence of Jesus in them and the presence of Jesus through you. I was sent this really cool picture. This is one of our communities. It's the grocery distribution community. This is a community, a small group of people, and they go out, out of Cottonwood, and they send, and they deliver groceries, and they deliver food to people who are hungry, and they just won an award from Los Al City for volunteer merit for what they do in bringing Jesus and bringing food. I was so proud of them, so incredibly proud of them. But when you talk to these Cottonwood people, you know what they will tell you? They will tell you that when they do this, more than ever, they are so aware of God's presence in them. And if you're here and you're going, wow, Joel, I don't always feel God's presence. I'm not always aware that he's present. Sometimes I feel very distant from him. Spiritual friends, sharing sacred moments regarding their divine purpose and their divine calling. Can I be really practical with you? If we're gonna go out and be Jesus to people, then we should take somebody we know, somebody we love, somebody who is hurting, somebody who's far from God, take them out to coffee, sit down with them, listen and understand. Let the presence of Jesus in you flow into them. Nobody discovered the presence of Jesus because we posted a rebuttal to their social media post. Nobody gets Jesus that way. And if you really care about that person who sometimes puts really inflammatory remarks against you or against the church, if you really care about them, do not rebut them on social media. Take them to coffee and sit down with them and let them feel the presence of Jesus coming through you and experience the presence of Jesus coming through. And do you know what you will discover? You will discover Jesus so much more fully in you because when you are posting that rebut on social media, you're not feeling much of Jesus either. But when you have that connection, all of a sudden Jesus is now working through you. There is a presence that is in you that you discover in this divine purpose. So young marrieds, they get together 
in our young marrieds community and they pray together and they worship together. They're doing Acts 13 and they're getting geared up together and then when a young married couple leaves and they go back to their apartment building, all of a sudden they sense this light that they have and they reach out to other young marrieds and they become so much aware of God's presence in them. Spiritual friends sharing sacred encounters for their divine purpose. You will discover God in some kinds of mysterious, amazing ways. I had a friend very close to me. He was one of my groomsmen in my wedding. And then he moved back to his home city. And I was going on a missions trip to Nepal. So I invited Brian to come with me. He had his men's group. They got together. They were doing Acts 13, spiritual friends, praying, worshiping. They felt like God was saying, by the Spirit of God, Brian, go. They laid hands on him. They sent him with me. He had never been on a mission trip before. We go into Nepal, one of the poorest countries of the world. We're with these pastors who are in a really, really difficult situation. And all of a sudden, Brian just begins to weep. I mean, weeping and crying. Now, you got to know, Brian, he's an FBI agent. He was on a SWAT team. He does not cry. He never cries. And here he is in Nepal, and he's weeping, and he's weeping, and he goes, pulls me aside. Joel, I don't know if I can teach. I'm just overwhelmed. He goes, I've never experienced this. What's going on? I'm not a crier. I said, Brian, you're not crying. The Spirit of God in you is crying. The Spirit of God in you is crying through you. Of course, once he hears that, now he's bawling, you know? <laughs> now it's Brian and the Spirit of God crying together. Have you ever experienced the Spirit of God in that way? Where there is such a presence that you know, this is not me. I'm not the one who has this much compassion because I actually don't like this person. <laughs> and the Spirit of God is now expressing godly compassion through you to them. When somebody hurts you, really hurts you, and you step out in faith, in that divine purpose, and you forgive them, and you go, this is not me. Because in my flesh, I still am really ticked off at this person, but the Spirit of God is in you, and you discover God's presence in you because of the divine purpose that you have chosen to be present in. Spiritual friends, sharing sacred encounters for their divine purpose. If you are present in each one of those, if you are present with your five, whether it's in a community or in a support group, or you, just, you have them, and those five are getting together, and you are praying, and you are worshiping, and you are opening up the word, and you are giving the Holy Spirit because of your attention, time, so that you go, wow, everything else shuts down and I will be fully present for God. You ever had a conversation with somebody and you know they're not quite there? They're either checking their phone or they're looking someplace else. And there's nothing more almost demeaning than when you're having a conversation with somebody and they're not fully present for you. But we do that with the Lord sometimes. And he's got all this grace. He says, no, no, I want to have this sacred encounter, but you have got to be fully present. So I close my eyes and I breathe 30 times before I open up the word. So he has my full attention. Spiritual friends sharing sacred encounters for a divine purpose, because in that moment, I feel sent. And I know as I go in love and in grace, I'm gonna discover more of God. If I hide out just in my community and do not touch the world, I'm missing out on God. Do not turn the channel. 